First Ladies of the United States of America. Part 3, Keeping It Civil. When the United States elects a new president, they are often also voting for their spouse. The unelected, unpaid White House hostesses have the considerable duty of smoothing the way for diplomacy, preserving White House history, and humanizing the president's image. Their personal triumphs and tragedies are played out on a worldwide stage. They influence the nation as fashion icons, social activists, and arbiters of change. In this six-part series, we'll meet the 53 fascinating women who have served as First Lady and see how the role has evolved over the past two and a half centuries. Mary Todd Lincoln was born in Lexington, Kentucky. Her wealthy family owned enslaved people. When Mary was six, her mother died giving birth to her seventh child. Her father remarried and Mary had a difficult relationship with her stepmother, who gave birth to nine children of her own. Mary was sent to finishing school where she learned French, literature, dance, drama, music, and social graces. At 20, she moved to Springfield, Illinois to live with her older sister, Elizabeth, wife of a former governor. Mary was witty and gregarious and earned a number of suitors, including politician Stephen Douglas. But she chose his lanky rival, Abraham Lincoln. She was 23 and he 33 when they wed. Mary gave birth to four sons, Robert, Edward, who died of tuberculosis at four, William, and Thomas. During Abraham's years as a traveling circuit judge, he was gone for months at a time. He savored coming home to his wife's simple cooking, with the occasional splurge on imported oysters. She supported him socially and politically, including during his campaign for presidency. The White House years were hard on Mary, as she had grown up in the South and spent her adult life on the Western frontier. She was unused to Eastern culture, and her manners were considered coarse. Kentucky was a border state, and while her husband was fighting to keep the Union together, several of her brothers joined the Confederate Army and were killed in action. She often visited wounded soldiers and helped them write letters home, and she accompanied her husband on visits to the battlefield. Mary had the responsibility of throwing social functions, and she refurbished the rundown rooms of the White House. In the midst of the costly war, she was criticized for overspending. At 11 years old, her son Willie died of typhoid fever. Both parents were shattered. Mary took to her bed for three weeks and was unable to attend the funeral or look after her youngest son, Tad. Public response to the tragedy was cold, as so many young men were being killed in battle. Some said Mary was lucky to have been with her son when he died. Mary suffered migraines all her adult life, which were exacerbated by a head injury during a carriage accident. She also experienced mood swings and bouts of depression, and was known for a fierce temper and public outbursts. Historians speculate that she may have had bipolar disorder. On April 9, 1865, the Confederacy surrendered and the Civil War came to an end. The Lincolns were elated. Five days later, the couple attended a performance of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater. Mary had a headache and wanted to stay home, but Abraham insisted that they attend as the newspapers had announced their appearance. During the third act, Mary and Abraham drew close together, holding hands. Mary whispered, What will Miss Harris think of my hanging on you so? The president smiled and replied, She won't think anything of it. Five minutes later, Abraham Lincoln was shot in the back of the head by Confederate John Wilkes Booth. He was still holding his wife's hand. Mary accompanied her mortally wounded husband across the street to a boarding house where the tall president was laid crosswise on the bed. Mary was unhinged with grief and was taken out of the room. Her oldest son, Robert, sat with his father throughout the night. Shortly before 7 a.m., Mary was allowed to return to her husband's side. 
The doctor reported. She seated herself by the president, kissed him, and called him every endearing name. His breath grew quieter, his face calm. As he drew his last breath, he smiled broadly and then expired at 7.22 a.m. He was 57. Mary received messages of condolence from around the world. She wrote back to Queen Victoria, who had lost her own husband four years earlier. I am deeply grateful for this expression of tender sympathy, coming from a heart which, from its own sorrow, can appreciate the intense grief I now endure. Mary moved to Chicago with her sons Robert and Tad. Tad died at the age of 18 from tuberculosis or congestive heart failure. Mary's compounded grief was unbearable, and her one surviving son, Robert, now a rising lawyer, was alarmed by his mother's erratic behavior. She abruptly ended a vacation in Florida to race home, convinced that Robert was deathly ill, only to find him perfectly healthy. She spent eccentrically on things she would never use, including brightly colored gowns, though she only wore black in her widowhood. She had a fear of poverty and sewed $56,000 into her petticoats. Robert appealed to the court to have his mother institutionalized. She was so upset by his treatment that she attempted suicide. She went to several pharmacies and bought enough laudanum to kill herself, but an alert pharmacist gave her a placebo instead. Once committed to Bellevue Asylum, Mary smuggled letters to her lawyer, instructing him to write to the Chicago Times about her condition. The story publicly embarrassed Robert. As he now controlled his mother's finances, his motivations were called into question. Mary was deemed competent and released. She was estranged from Robert for several years. She spent four years living in France and touring Europe. As her health declined, she returned to live with her sister Elizabeth in Illinois. She and Robert did make peace before her death. On the 11th anniversary of Tad's death, she collapsed and died the next day at 63. She was laid to rest in Springfield, Illinois with her husband Abraham and three of their sons, Eddie, Willie, and Tad. Eliza McArdle Johnson was born in Tennessee, the only child of a shoemaker. At 16, she spotted 18-year-old Andrew Johnson arriving in town with all of his belongings. She liked him at once and they wed. Eliza had attended school while Andrew could barely read and write. She tutored him and read to him while he worked in his tailor shop. They had three sons and two daughters. With Eliza's quiet support, Andrew worked his way up to Mayor of Greenville, then Tennessee Senate, then U.S. House and Senate. In 1865, he became Abraham Lincoln's vice president. During the Civil War, Eliza was forced out of her Tennessee home by Confederate soldiers. When Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew assumed the role of president. By this time, Eliza was ill with tuberculosis. She spent most of her time in her White House bedroom, while her daughter, Martha, performed the duties of hostess. Eliza attended only two events during her four years as First Lady, a reception for Queen Emma of Hawaii and her husband's birthday party. She died in 1876, six months after her husband. She was 65. Julia Dent Grant was born on a plantation near St. Louis, Missouri. She attended a one-room schoolhouse and then a girls' boarding school. Julia excelled at piano, horseback riding, and loved reading novels. She had strabismus, which made her eyes crossed. While attending West Point Military Academy, her brother Fred made friends with classmate Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses spent time with the Dent family. When Julia's pet canary died, he crafted a yellow coffin and summoned eight fellow cadets to give it a funeral. He asked Julia to wear his class ring, a sign of their attachment. Ulysses' regiment was ordered to the Mexican-American War. Distraught, Julia had an intense dream that he would return to her. He did come home for a short visit, and they became engaged. 
They married four years later, and Grant's father refused to attend because Julia's family owned enslaved people. Julia gave birth to three sons and a daughter, while Ulysses was often away with the army. Missing his family, he resigned, and they moved to a small farm called Hardscrabble. Their life was hard, and they barely made ends meet. Regardless, Ulysses bought an enslaved man from Fred, then emancipated him. Ulysses contracted malaria and was unable to run the farm, so they moved to Illinois, where he worked in his father's leather business. At the beginning of the Civil War, he took command of the Illinois troops and was promoted to Major General. He was lonely without Julia, so she left the children with relatives and traveled with him as he fought the war. In 1864, President Lincoln appointed Ulysses commander of the Union armies. The president was well aware of Julia's positive effects on her husband, so sent for her to join him. In 1865, Confederate General Robert E. Lee formally surrendered to Grant, thus ending the Civil War. Julia owned an enslaved woman named Jewel who traveled with her for much of her life, even after the Emancipation Proclamation. But the proclamation excluded Missouri. After the war, when the Grants were on their way back to St. Louis, Jewel left them, fearing she would lose her freedom. Three years later, Ulysses received the Republican nomination for president. Julia was even more thrilled than her husband. When he won the election, he said to her, My dear, I hope you're satisfied. With her increased public profile, Julia considered surgery to correct her strabismus. But Ulysses told her, I might not like you half as well with any other eyes. Because of her condition, Julia almost always posed in profile for portraits. After the dark war years and the assassination, Washington was ready for a little levity, and Mrs. Grant was happy to oblige. She offered a full array of events, including lavish state dinners and informal public receptions, though she insisted gentlemen leave their guns at home. Julia was frustrated when the role of First Lady failed to be publicly recognized. She sought to improve the stature of women. She once grilled Brigham Young about polygamy. After eight years in the White House, she was disappointed when Ulysses declined to run for a third term. The couple embarked on a two-year tour of Europe, Africa, and Asia. They settled in New York City, but lost their fortune in a risky business venture. Ulysses was diagnosed with throat cancer, and in his final days, he completed his memoir, the sale of which left Julia financially secure. In widowhood, she moved to Washington, D.C., and acted as a mentor to younger first ladies. She was the first first lady to write her own memoir, though no one would publish it until 75 years after her death. She died in 1902, age 76, and was laid to rest next to her husband in Grant's tomb in New York City. Lucy Webb Hayes was born in Ohio, when on a mission to Kentucky to free 20 enslaved people he had inherited, her father died in a cholera epidemic. Her widowed mother was advised to sell the enslaved people to support her children, but she said she would take in washing before she would sell a person. Lucy first met lawyer Rutherford B. Hayes when she was 14 and he 23. His mother pushed for a match, but he replied that Lucy was not yet old enough to fall in love with. Lucy graduated from Cincinnati Wesleyan Female College, making her the first first lady with a university degree. She wrote in an essay, Her mind is as strong as a man's. Instead of being considered the slave of a man, she is considered his equal in all things and his superior in some. At 19, she met Rutherford again at a wedding. He found a gold ring in the cake and gave it to her. He wrote in his diary, I guess I am a great deal in love with Lucy. When they became engaged, she returned the wedding cake ring, and he wore it for the rest of his life. 
Rutherford initially thought that the abolition of slavery was too radical, but Lucy persuaded him to defend fugitive enslaved people who crossed into Ohio from Kentucky. When the Civil War broke out, Lucy encouraged Rutherford to enlist, and she visited him in the field often, sometimes bringing their children. Their infant son, Joe, died while at an army camp. Lucy aided her doctor brother in caring for wounded soldiers. The men nicknamed her Mother Lucy. A 20-year-old William McKinley once spent hours tending a campfire to keep her warm. After the war, Rutherford won a seat in Congress. Lucy regularly sat in the gallery to listen to debates and wore a checkered shawl so that he could spot her. She became an activist for the welfare of children and veterans. The couple lost two more sons, two-year-old George and newborn Manning. Rutherford was next elected governor of Ohio. Lucy played an active role in her husband's administration and lobbied for more funding for schools, orphanages, and asylums. Rutherford was elected president in 1876. There were no funds to refurbish the White House, so Lucy made do with old furniture from the attic and rearranging things to hide holes in the carpets and drapes. Lucy was the first woman to be widely referred to as first lady in the press. Despite the many responsibilities of White House hostess, the position did not come with the staff, so Lucy had to rely on nieces, cousins, and friends to volunteer to help her throw events. She was kind to White House staff and threw Thanksgiving dinners for them with three turkeys and a roasted pig. When children were banned from rolling Easter eggs on the Capitol grounds, Lucy invited them to use the White House lawn, launching the annual Easter egg roll. The presidential couple toured the South, hoping to build unity after the Civil War, and Lucy was the first First Lady to visit the West Coast. She won people over wherever she went. After Rutherford's retirement to Ohio, Lucy joined the Women's Relief Corps, taught Sunday school, called attention to the plight of poor African Americans, and spoke out against Mormon polygamy. Rutherford wrote to his wife, My life with you has been so happy, so successful, so beyond reasonable anticipation, that I think of you with a loving gratitude that I do not know how to express. At 57, she suffered a stroke and died. Rutherford died three years later and was buried beside her. Lucretia Rudolph Garfield was born in Ohio. Her father was a co-founder of Hiram College, which, unusual for the time, admitted women. While attending, she met teacher James Garfield. Lucretia didn't want to rely on her father or husband to support her, so she became a teacher. She and James married when both were 26. His service in the Union Army during the Civil War separated them, but after the war, he returned and they had seven children. The couple were inseparable and shared friends and interests in literature and politics. Lucretia's understanding of the intrigues of the Republican Party were invaluable to James's career. As First Lady, she was more interested in policy than party planning and recommended cabinet members. But she ran the expected dinners and events and was highly regarded for her hospitality. A few months into their tenure, Lucretia contracted malaria and went to the New Jersey shore to recover. While at the train station on his way to visit her, President James Garfield was shot in the back and arm by madman Charles Guiteau. Lucretia raced back to Washington. Her train went so fast it nearly derailed. When she arrived, she stayed at James's bedside for three months as he slowly succumbed to infection. After the funeral, Lucretia took her children back to Ohio. She preserved her husband's papers and built a wing on their family home as a presidential library. She spent winters in Pasadena, California, where she helped to design her own home. She served in the Red Cross during World War I. Lucretia died in 1918, age 85. 
In 1859, Chester A. Arthur married Ellen Herndon, and the pair had three children. Ellen died of pneumonia in 1881, age 52. Twenty months later, Chester was promoted from vice president to president when James Garfield was assassinated. Chester relied on his sister, Mary Arthur McElroy, to be his White House hostess. She also helped him raise his children. She had her own four children to raise and a husband in Albany, so limited her time in Washington to the winter social season. She enlisted former first ladies, Julia Tyler and Harriet Lane to assist her. Mary supported civil rights for African Americans and hosted Booker T. Washington, but joined the Albany Association opposed to women's suffrage. She died in Albany in 1917, age 75. Rose Cleveland was born in upstate New York, the youngest of nine children. Her father died when she was seven. As her siblings left home to start careers and get married, Rose stayed to care for her widowed mother. She became a teacher. Three years after her mother died, she moved to Washington to run the White House for her bachelor older brother, Grover Cleveland. Rose was criticized for being too intelligent and lacking social graces. A year into his presidency, Grover married Frances Folsom, and she took over as first lady. Rose became the principal of the Collegiate Institute of Lafayette, Indiana, and the editor of the magazine Literary Life. She had a relationship with Evangeline Simpson, and they moved to Italy together. Rose died during the 1918 flu pandemic at the age of 72. Frances Folsom Cleveland was born in Buffalo, New York. She was named Frank at birth, and though her name was later feminized, she was called Frank by close friends. Grover Cleveland was a longtime friend of her father and first met Frances when he was 27 and she was an infant. Grover doted on her and bought her a baby carriage. When Frances was 11, her father died, and the court appointed Grover administrator of his estate. While she was attending Wells College, Frances and her mother Emma visited Grover after he was elected president. Emma believed she might receive a proposal from the 48-year-old president and was alarmed when her 20-year-old daughter did instead. Emma took Francis on a nine-month tour of Europe, but upon their return, Francis was still determined to marry the president. They were wed on June 2, 1886, in the Blue Room at the White House. The White House was filled with flowers, and the bride wore a train trailed in orange blossoms. The press obsessed over the wedding and the beautiful young bride, who became a celebrity like no first lady had before. She accompanied Grover on a tour of the country, and her fame increased. She was plastered on every magazine, and companies hijacked her image to sell products. Her hairstyles and off-the-shoulder gowns were copied, and false rumors that she had stopped wearing a bustle caused the impractical garment to go out of fashion. To shield his bride, Grover purchased a farm in Georgetown Heights, and he and Francis only lived at the White House during the winter social season. Grover believed that a woman should not bother her head about politics, and he dictated much of his wife's activities. Nonetheless, she supported women in many ways. She invited female musicians to play at the White House, held a weekly reception for working women, and helped to establish the Washington Home for Friendless Colored Girls. In 1888, Grover lost re-election, and the family moved to New York City. There, Frances gave birth to her first child, Ruth. Four years later, Grover won back the White House, becoming the only president to serve non-consecutive terms. Against his wishes, Francis's likeness was used a great deal in his campaign materials, and his image as a doting husband and father improved his appeal. Francis gave birth to two more daughters at the White House, Esther and Marion. 
the daughters too were exploited by advertisers, including Baby Ruth candy bars. Once a group of tourists overwhelmed their nanny on the White House lawn, grabbed the babies, and passed them around. In 1897, the Clevelands left the White House and moved to Princeton, New Jersey. They welcomed two sons, Richard and Francis. In 1904, 12-year-old Ruth died of diphtheria, and Francis suffered severe depression. Four years later, Grover died. The widow took her four children to Europe for a six-month tour. At 48, she married professor of archaeology Thomas J. Preston. During World War I, Frances became director of the National Security League. She stirred up controversy with her opinions that everyone in America should assimilate and that school children should be indoctrinated to support the war. She also spoke out against women's suffrage, saying women weren't yet intelligent enough to vote. Frances died in her sleep in 1947, age 83. Caroline Scott Harrison was born in Ohio, the daughter of a science and mathematics professor at Miami University. Her father was fired for opposing slavery and took a job at Farmer College, where one of his freshman students was Benjamin Harrison. Dr. Scott next founded the Oxford Female Institute, where Caroline studied literature, theater, art, and painting and taught piano. Benjamin transferred to be closer to Caroline, whom he was courting. The two became engaged during his senior year, but postponed their marriage so that he could study law and she could complete her degree. Their first years were a struggle. A fire destroyed their home, and Benjamin spent long hours working and socializing to build up his legal practice. Caroline returned to her parents' house to deliver the first of their three children. During the Civil War, Benjamin recruited a thousand men for a regiment and was promoted to Brigadier General. Caroline joined ladies' committees to support the war effort. Benjamin became a U.S. Senator and was elected President in 1888. Caroline renovated and modernized the White House. She had electricity installed, but was too frightened to handle the switches. In 1889, Caroline put up the first White House Christmas tree, a German tradition which was just becoming popular in the UK and US. She raised funds for Johns Hopkins Medical School on the condition that it admit women. Caroline came down with tuberculosis and died in the White House in 1892 at the age of 60. Her daughter, Mary Harrison McKee, took over as hostess for the final six months of her father's presidency. Benjamin later married his late wife's niece, Mary Dimmick, who was a month younger than his daughter. Both of his children opposed the marriage and became estranged from their father for the rest of his life. Mary died in 1930, age 72. In the next episode, we'll meet the first ladies of the early 20th century, who saw the U.S. through two world wars and the Great Depression. We'll learn how Edith Wilson became the nation's first unelected president, and why Eleanor Roosevelt is considered to be one of the greatest Americans in history. Don't want to wait for the next episode? Patrons get exclusive early access to all my multi-part series. For as little as $1 a month, you can become a patron and help me make more fascinating history videos. To join, check out the link in the description. Thank you for watching. Want even more tea on history? Check out the History Tea Time podcast, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts.